Welcome everyone to theoretical and computational biophysics seminar, um, uh, the second seminar this week. Uh, so we are hosting Dr. Gerhard Gomper <clears throat> from uh, uh, Julisch uh, Forschungszentrum, the research center in Germany. Before I introduce Dr. Gomper, so I would remind everybody to please turn off your microphone during the talk. If you want, you can turn on your cameras to get a more interactive feel to the seminar, but definitely turn off your microphone. And if you have any questions, uh, we can keep them for the end of the talk or end of the chapter that um, Dr. Gumper can uh, determine during his talk. So I'm gonna invite you, or you can actually come in and uh, ask your uh, questions uh, at the end of each chapter or at the end of the talk. So with that, it's really great pleasure for me to uh, introduce uh, uh, Professor Gerhard Gomper from the Institute of Biological Information Processing, uh, Julisch Forschung Centrum, as I pointed out. By way of introduction, um, um, uh, the Professor Gomper was trained as a physicist at at uh, Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, both his diploma and PhD he did there. After doing some postdoc in the US at the University of Washington, and uh, he returns to LMU, the University of Munich, as a research assistant, and then he joins as a staff scientist. Uh, uh, he joins Max Planck Institute for a few years before actually moving to the uh, uh, Ulish Research Center or Forschung Centrum, which is actually, for those of you who might not know, a major interdisciplinary research center in Germany. Uh, and he is currently directing uh, the Institute of Biological Information Processing there. His own research group within this um, uh, unit is focusing on theoretical physics of living matter. And research-wise, he, uh, he is working on diverse phenomena and, and material related to biology or otherwise, including uh, a lot of polymers, membranes, amphiphiles, for those of you who are interested in self-organizing, self-healing material, all the way to hydrodynamics and microfluidics and also simulation of cells, synthetic cells. I noticed actually in his publication, he has a long list of publications, almost 400 papers, more than 20,000 20, times cited. And his Google H index is 78. So you can actually appreciate the uh, impact of his research uh, uh, on the community. So, so he, we have some common ground. So uh, he, uh, he is not simulating and modeling things at the molecular level necessarily, but uh, I think in terms of techniques and uh, models, we can uh, definitely benefit from each other's experience. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gomper, for accepting our invitation. I know it's uh, evening time in Germany, in Europe, uh, but we really look forward to your seminar, please. Okay. Well, thanks a lot uh, for this very nice introduction and, of course, for the invitation. I'm very happy to uh, uh, tell you a little bit about our recent work, and I'm mean, be happy to discuss then uh, some further um, activities or maybe even collaborations. All right, so uh, I want to tell you today uh, about active polymers, vesicles, and cells. And cells is, of course, more like a model cell, so don't, don't expect anything really uh, biological here. Uh, but the main, the main uh, aspect is this active. So I really want to show you self-propelled uh, particles, which are formed together as polymers and how they interact with uh, vesicles and, and membranes. All right, so uh, let me start with a little uh, introduction uh, about active filaments and cells. And uh, well, I think the most well-known uh, example is this motility assays, which were is, um, originally used to study motor proteins. So we anchor motor proteins anchored on a surface and actin filaments in this case are thrown on top and the motor proteins push the, um, these um, filaments uh, forward. Yeah, so this is a kind of a activity, and you see in the in the bottom here, you see a, a snapshot from from an um, 
an experiment. Now, there are also uh, many other kind of filamentous systems, in particular motile bacteria. This here is Bacillus subtilis, and uh, it's um, gliding uh, on surfaces. You can see that it's a rod-like uh, bacterium, and then I've started this movie, you see that it forms nice uh, clusters, and they are moving and uh, strongly interacting with each other. There's another type of uh, bacterium. Uh, well, there are probably many more, but uh, this is also a nice example. This is Proteus mirabilis. And uh, as you can see, this is much less rod-like, much more flexible object. And it uh, forms a really wild uh, type and a very chaotic, almost tempted to say, turbulent uh, motion. Yeah, then uh, the next example I'm sure you know quite well, this is the cytoskeleton. In this case, we have uh, these motor proteins which connect uh, two microtubules and slide uh, them res with respect to each other. And this leads to this uh, cytoplasmic streaming in this uh, oocyte, which you saw. Uh, I'm not sure I can restart it. Let me see. Yeah, so here you can see that uh, it really generates large scale uh, flows in this uh, network of microtubules. Then a more synthetic system is um, polymers in active bars that uh, uh, refers here to this right side of the, this right picture. And so you, here you have a passive polymer and it's in, interacting with uh, Janus uh, colloids, which are self-propelled. Uh, and they interact with, uh, with these passive polymers. Or you can think uh, it's a very similar uh, system from a theoretical point of view. You have a chain of these uh, Janus particles, and the Janus particles are randomly oriented and it pull in a different direction, but of course they have also rotational motion. Now here you can see an experimental re realization uh, of such a system. So this is connected colloidal particles. And finally, the uh, cell motility, yeah, this is not a movie, so this is just the shape of a moving cell. This is a keratocyte moving on a surface, but you see that it's very uh, um, anisotropic and the, the, the B direction would be the, the direction of motion. All right, so what we are interested in is uh, this interplay of the propulsion of the self-propulsion and the deformation uh, of these objects or the shapes of these objects. So let me start with, with the self-propelled uh, worm-like chains, worm-like filaments. And uh, so self-propelled means each of these little beads has a uh, propulsion force. The propulsion force is tangential to the, to the contour. And um, yeah, and all beads are uh, self-propelled in, in, in the same way. So uh, we modeled this by uh, as, as usual, as you normally uh, model polymers or filaments by a uh, bead spring chain. Yeah, bead spring means that well, you see the beads and they are connected by springs and uh, warm like because there's also a, a bending rigidity which keeps it more or less straight depending on the, on the strength of the bending rigidity. In addition, we have uh, um, this uh, repulsive uh, WCA, weak strand Anderson potentials to uh, in case they are uh, coming close to each other, if you have several polymers or if they are somehow hitting itself, as you will see, uh, it's possible as you will see in a, in a minute. And, and I only explained to you this active tangential driving force. And then just uh, to, to have some um, easy numbers for characterization, right? we need dimensionless numbers in order to compare with other simulations, to compare with experiments. So this is the persistence length divided by the contour length of the chain. And this is given by the bending rigidity divided by the thermal energy times the length. We have the Pickle number. And this you should remember, I'm, I will repeat, I mean, this comes up again and again. So this is essentially the uh, driving uh, velocity. So the average speed with which the chain is moving, the length divided by the translational diffusion coefficient. And if you look here on the other side, which is just if you uh, express this in other units, this is the propulsion force. Uh, and um, this is again the thermal energy. So you see the friction coefficient, which appears both in the velocity and in the translational diffusion coefficient actually drops out. So you can read the Peckley number essentially also as the driving force. 
Okay. And then finally, we did define this uh, flexure number, which is the Peglin number divided by the persistence length. So that essentially determines, is, is, uh, mainly also determines the, the ratio between the driving force and the persistence, uh, the, the bending rigidity. Okay, so now we can see what happens if we, we do this. So this movie, which I'm showing you here, so the points are just, uh, there are no obstacles in space. These little points are just that you see how the uh, chain is moving uh, in, in 3D space. And why is it not starting? Okay, now. Yeah, so the front end is, is the dark end. So the, the propulsion is towards the dark end and, and the trailing end is the light end. And you see that this is actually uh, quite a random motion, but still uh, moving more or less persistently in, in, in one direction, but still has some uh, diffusive uh, motion. So if you look at this uh, for different bending rigidities uh, or different propulsion strengths, I will come into a phase diagram a little later, then we see there's one regime over here, the first one, which we call the polymer regime, because if you look at the conformations and this is here, these, these insets, the, the black and white insets, that is the conformations, they look very much like uh, flexible polymers. The red one, is the uh, trajectory as a function uh, of, yeah, of time, but as, uh, as it goes through space, right? So if we go to, um, okay, uh, I think to probably two more flexible polymers, then you see what, uh, so it's still moving forward, but sometimes it forms these little spirals. So it actually somehow it's like a snake which uh, hits its own uh, tail and then it starts to, to spiral around. And if you go to even more, flexible polymers, then the spiraling increases and it's most of the time spiraling and only occasionally then moving forward. Now, if you, if you look at um, the different propulsion strengths, which are related to the, to the uh, bending with GDD, but as I said, I will come to a phase diagram uh, in a minute. So if you look at weak propulsion, we have this polymer-like behavior, but an enhanced rotational diffusion. And this you see in this graph, right? So what you see here, this is the rotational diffusion made dimensionless by some internal time scale and as a function of the flexure number. And you see that essentially all the data for different persistence lengths uh, and different propulsion strengths all fall essentially on this, this same cur curve where you see that the uh, rotational diffusion increases linearly with the propulsion strength over the propulsion velocity. And then for large, uh, propulsion strength, we have this uh, spiraling motion, which I, which I indicated uh, up here. Now let's uh, look a little bit, right? this, this is a, a somehow surprising uh, result that all these rotational diffusion constants follow exactly the same, the same curve. So how we can understand this? This should be easy, relatively easy to, to understand. And so, uh, so what we see is just an interpretation of this plot, we see that the uh, rotational diffusion is def defined by the temporal evolution of the end-to-end -end vector. So this is the quote tangent vector from, for the end-to-end -end distance. And uh, this decays as a function of time and the uh, characteristic time scale is this inverse uh, rotational diffusion uh, coefficient. Okay, now here comes my little uh, theory and it's really a very simple theory. Yeah, so we assume a railway motion. Yeah, so with railway motion, we mean that take a config configuration of a flexible polymer, an equilibrium configuration. Yeah? And then you say, this is actually the trajectory. And then we move a little forward. And again, this is like in equilibrium. So we just somehow extend the chain as you would actually do in Monte Carlo simulation of simple polymer models where you have this chain growth algorithm, you cut away a monomer at the end and add it uh, in front, but it's all equilibrium. Or you can also think of take an infinitely long flexible chain. And uh, so the polymer and, and this filament is doing always runs along this trajectory of the, of the infinitely long polymer. Yeah? And then, set, then we can use equilibrium theory of polymers, right? That we say, if you have an infinitely long polymer, it's tangent vector at position S and S prime, they have this exponential decay yeah, without, without any self-avoidance. Yeah? So this is just the ideal polymer chain. So this is the same here too, 
But now in addition, we have this time dependence because the point S is actually not the point S uh, at, on this uh, infinitely long chain all the time, but it's actually moving with this velocity V. So the point S is moving uh, with V times S is, is just has this additional uh, motion along the, along the contour, right? And as I said, this VC is the uh, uh, polymer contour. So what we, we use here is just this exponential correlation of an ideal polymer chain without uh, self-avoidance. And then we have to just integrate this over S and S prime to get the end-to-end -end, uh, distance or end-to-end -end vectors. And then, uh, well, this is a, a one-line calculation. And then you find exactly that the rotational diffusion coefficient is velocity over persistence length, which is exactly what we plot here. Yeah, so, uh, and as you can see, this is in perfect, perfect agreement. So uh, for the weak propulsion, we really see uh, essentially the same behavior as a, a um, equilibrium chain and the enhanced rotation just comes because the polymer is just following uh, the, this trajectory of a long chain. All right, so here is the, the phase diagram I, I promised. Yeah, so here if, uh, for large um, persistence length and weak Peclet numbers, weak propulsions, we have this polymer regime. And for high uh, Peclet numbers and small persistence length, we this, see this uh, spiraling regime. Yeah, so, uh, so green is uh, roughly the, the boundary between these two regimes. And uh, this shows, right, this is a linear line in this uh, double logarithmic plot with slope one. So uh, the boundary is given by a persistence length roughly uh, proportional to the, to the Peclet number. And I think you can understand this behavior and I will come back to this in, a, in a soon. Uh, for many polymers, you can understand this rather easily if the persistence length is long and the propulsion is weak, well then the propulsion can hardly do much. That the, the propulsion force has to somehow overcome the bending uh, energy. And so the, uh, the bending force, which is proportional to kappa, to persistence length, has to somehow be proportional to the, to the forward driving force. Yeah? Bending force versus driving force. And that makes the difference between little deformation and strong deformation. All right, now we can look at the same model if uh, with a little load in front. Yeah, And what this load does, it restricts both the uh, translational motion, but also the rotational motion. Right? If you have something in front of you want to push forward, then there can be a, a buckling instability. And that's exactly what we will see. And but in, if you have a, a, a load which has a low um, rotational, a high, high rotational friction, but then it's also difficult uh, to turn. And then therefore we see different behaviors depending on whether you have a high translational or a high rotational friction. Yeah, if I look at this one here first. Yeah, so then you see that it, it starts to buckle but it cannot rotate, the, the load cannot rotate quickly enough. Otherwise you would just see a circling motion, but, uh, but the polymer somehow is pushing too hard and therefore it's uh, actually turning in the, in the opposite direction. And we see a, a similar behavior with a, with a different kind of load, different, uh, different uh, persistence length and so on. Yeah, and so this looks a little bit like the motion of sperm with a beating uh, tail, but I want to emphasize this wiggling has nothing to do with the propulsion. It's generated by the propulsion, that is, but it does not contribute to the propulsion. In contrast, it actually slows down the propulsion, right? Because if in such a conformation here, the propulsion force is not always in the forward direction, but part of the propulsion force is somehow used up for this, for this wiggling. So it actually slows down rather than speeds up to, due to the wiggling. Yeah, and here is an example, an experimental example from this paper, which I showed you in the beginning, where you can actually see that they, uh, you can see this kind of uh, wiggling motion also in this uh, Janus colloid chains. All right, now this was all for a single chain. I, mean, I, I noticed that I have to speed up a bit. Uh, so, um, so this was for a single chain. Now, if you go to higher con uh, concentration, and so this is now still a relatively small concentration. It should be set somewhere. I think the concentration is 0.2. Okay, I see, can't see it now, it doesn't matter. Um, so the concentration of 0.2, and it depends a little bit, I don't want to discuss this now, that uh, it depends a little bit on the length of the, of the chain. 
so if you look at it, yeah, so you see these little points here, these little dollets, which look like a little bit my, my pointer, this is actually spiraling filaments. And occasionally they unwind and maybe hit another polymer, which then also unwinds and, and goes back to, to, to spiraling again. And this behavior, and I mean, it's used something similar for, for shorter filaments. Let, let's not talk about this now. Yeah, so, um, so but we, this, this now depends on, on the volume fraction, on the concentration, yeah? This is the, S here is the spiraling number, somehow how many, how often does it go around each other? And here is, this is the effective cluster size, M is the cluster size. So, uh, uh, if you increase the volume fraction, you see there's a spiraling number goes down quickly. So that means uh, you'd see less and less uh, spirals. And at the same time, the clusters uh, um, size increases. That means as the polymers go, around, uh, go away from the spiraling, they hit each other and they start to form uh, bigger clusters. Yeah, and um, this is now at a, at a somewhat higher concentration. I think this is 0.2 now. Yeah, and so you see, if you if you are at small Peclet number, small driving, then uh, you see uh, a similar behavior as you would see for self-propelled rods. You can also see here from the individual particles that the particles are actually pretty stiff, so they do not differ much from uh, from the behavior of a, of a rod. Although the behavior is different if you look at the clusters in more detail, but I don't want to go into the details now. I mean, they are a little bit more. Uh, um, easy and uh, they have, I mean, the, the, sorry, the, the rods are more stiff and therefore they move together more in one way, more persistently. Here you see some more easily this kind of uh, direction, a uh, change of uh, directions. So flexibility plays a role, but not a big role. Now, if you go to much higher Peclet number, and this is the same system, but then you see clusters essentially disappear. And this is quite unusual. This would you not would you not expect for rods because for rods you, they would just bump into each other harder and they would form bigger clusters, but you would not see this this cluster breakup. Yeah. So it's, you see at weak propulsion formation of mobile clusters, but at large propulsion the clusters uh, the filaments deforms and the clusters actually disappear. And and here you see how this uh, falls together in a in a phase diagram. Uh, but this is again the persistence length as a function of Peclet number. And if you look at some fixed persistence length, not too small, but then we see it actually a, a re entrant behavior. And that's what I was trying to show you uh, in the last two movies. Yeah, so at low propulsion, there is yeah, just uh, small clusters, um, not, not much. As the Peclet number increases, the, the, the clusters become bigger. But then at very high Peclet number, the clusters disappear again. Mm -hmm. and this is again, this is this dashed line. This is again controlled by what I emphasized before that persistence length is proportional to, to Peclet number. Yeah? At this point, the, the propulsion force is so strong that the clusters can actually, uh, the filaments inside the cluster can start to deform and maybe uh, move away from, from the cluster again. Whereas if you just would have hard rods, they would just keep pushing together and it's they have a very hard time to. Um, to change direction. Yeah, so, so I would say this is a very important uh, conclusion that if you have these deformable particles, that the, the, the mechanical flexibility, the forces related to mechanical flexibility and the propulsion forces have to be somehow on the same order of magnitude to see a transition between two regimes. Okay, and then we can go to. Uh, this was this, so this is still for a relatively low volume fraction 0.2. Now we can now go to a much higher volume fraction is essentially close packing. Yeah? So all the filaments are in contact with each other. And then we see for, this is here on the left, yeah, for a very small Peclet number, there's hardly any motion. That's right? so densely packed that it's just jammed phase. But if you go to a higher um, Peclet number, then you see that uh, filaments become mobile and they actually uh, all move together, not, not all to, together, right? It's, it's a kind of a nomadic phase here because you see here on top, you see streaming to the left, here you see streaming to the right, uh, but it's a, a well-ordered laning, laning kind of structure. But the most interesting one is here on the, on the right. If you take the number is really high, then the, you get this kind of uh, turbulent motion. 
Yeah, it's, it's all, uh, also called active turbulence or bacterial turbulence because it has been seen in, first seen in bacterial phases. I want to emphasize that there's no hydrodynamics in this, in this model. Yeah, this is uh, just the self-propelled filaments. There's no fluid around. They are bumping into each other, but there's also no momentum conservation. So it cannot simply be uh, hydrodynamic turbulence. Why do we call it turbulence? Well, uh, why are we justified to call it turbulence? When we look at this energy spectrum, yeah, this is the velocity-velocity correlation function uh, at different uh, points in space, but at the same time, so uh, uh, same instant in time, at different velocities in space, and then just the Fourier transform of it. And well, we look at this because this is usually used in hydrodynamic turbulence to characterize the turbulent phase. And in hydrodynamic turbulence, you get this characteristic decay that it goes like k to the minus five over three, well, 1.3 minus 1.33. And we also see a pretty large uh, power law behavior in our correlation function. And even the, um, the power law is not so different from uh, what is expected for hydrodynamic turbulence. Yeah, so this is still under uh, debate whether this has anything to do with each other. Uh, but um, I mean, I think we can call it uh, turbulence because it's a, a, a power law regime of the, of the energy spectrum. Yeah, and here just to, to give you again a feeling, yeah, this of course depends on the peg, uh, persistence length and the Pegli number. And uh, the active turbulence is of course favored by a high Pegli number, but of course also the persistence length has to be again, small enough so that the uh, particles are uh, sufficiently deformable. All right, uh, yeah, I think I will skip this over. Maybe this is actually a good time if somebody has uh, a few questions. Uh, yes, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, in, in your general introduction, you started your very first slide, you were showing actin. Can you give us a bit of a feel for what are typical persistence lengths in these models for like for actin or uh, the actin-like uh, FTSZ filament in bacteria? Um, I mean, this, this, this is just, I mean, what they do in experiments is just normal actin. Yeah, and I, I, must, I forgot the, the, the persistence length of actin, but it's... Um, um, and let and me just guess, I, I think it's 20, 20 nanometers or something like this. 20 nanometers, okay. So I'm just trying to put into perspective many of your plots. And then sure. what you're showing is some of the simulations. I guess those are like, uh, I think I may have missed it in the very first or second slide. Uh, are your polymers moving in a solution in 2D or on, on a surface? And so any uh, effect of the solvent is being captured in the diffusion coefficient. So you're not taking that explicitly into account with your, uh, in your simulations. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you are, sorry, I completely forgot to mention this. I mean, all the simulations I've shown you so far were without any hydrodynamics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's all just uh, Brownian dynamics uh, with this uh, self-propulsion. And I mean, right. so, so you th and, and it's all 2D. Yeah, so, so you, you can think of it as a particle moving on a surface. Uh, and um, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we could take into account uh, hydrodynamics. We simply have, have not done it because we had the feeling, well, it makes simply simulations longer and we have the feeling the in, at least for the dense system, hydrodynamics should not play such a, a, a crucial role. Furthermore, 2D hydrodynamics is a bit artificial, I, I'm tempted to say, right? Because it's a lot lo more long range than, than 3D hydrodynamics. So actually it may overestimate the, uh, the hydrodynamic effects in real experiments. But it's an important point. I mean, we, uh, so hydrodynamic effects are very, uh, very important, just I have not mentioned it today. So I had actually a kind of related question. So do you, maybe I missed it, I apologize. So you describe how a single polymer works. How do uh, multiple polymers interact? Is there any interaction between the polymer beyond the uh, volume exclusion? No, just volume exclusion. Any particular, volume no, exclusion. No, no, particular no attractive interaction, right? That is, that is the, I, I would say the hallmark of these driven systems that you get yeah. what's called modality induced phase separation, right? So the, this clustering, 
but right. without attraction, right? Everything is repulsive. So if you would just switch off the activity, everybody would just be homogeneously wow. distributed in, in space. It's amazing, actually, the phenomenon you can capture with that simple model. Very nice. Very, thank you. Yeah. And then just to uh, uh, reiterate that what people typically call a treadmilling mo model, where yes. uh, things are you know, advancing at the front and, and leaving it at the bottom, that sort of captured, and you said in your equilibrium state, by just sort of uh, uh, it's shifting the reference point. Uh, I think you I mean, we have no treadmilling. I mean, what I wanted, what I meant, if you would take a normal equilibrium polymer model to, to study equilibrium properties of polymers, then one way of doing it, you say, I take a, a, my chain and I cut away a polymer, a, a monomer at one end, and I add it with some random uh, right. um, mm -hmm. angle or rent, uh, at the other end. Yeah, in this way, uh, and then the chain is not moving at all. And it's just somehow you take, just take in the simulation monomers from one side, add it to the other side. And, and so that would also generate this kind of quote, propulsive motion, but it's not a dynamic motion. It's just a, a static uh, uh -huh. um, okay. way uh -huh. of, of generating new polymer configurations. All right, thank you. Anything else? Okay, good. Then uh, I, let me just uh, proceed. Um, I think I will not want to go into much detail, but just maybe just I show you two movies uh, because um, I mean there's another type of uh, of polymer where right? this is this uh, chain of um, Janus colloid. So we call it the Brownian polymer because each particle is somehow uh, um, passive brown, actually active Brownian particles particle and they are just uh, uh, chains together to form this this polymer and active Brownian particle means it's a particle a normal Brownian particle and it has an axis and the axis is doing a passive rotational diffusion but the axis also the particles also propelled along the axis so that means uh, as the uh, axis is rotating also the propulsion direction is is, is rotating Okay, so uh, as I said, let me not go into the details of the theoretical model uh, and also not in this uh, results set to just show you uh, how such a, a, a chain is actually moving. Yeah, and the, the color shows you the uh, propulsion direction. Doesn't really matter whether it's uh, red or uh, blue. Yeah, just say it's propelled in the blue direction and you say the blue direction is always changing in, in a rotational diffusive way and that generates a very uh, somehow unusual uh, dynamics of this polymer chain and if i just go back at, and that means that if you take a very flexible chain sorry i forgot to to add the um the, the stiffnesses so the the lower curve the blue curve that is a very flexible polymer and that is growing with increasing Peclet number with increasing active force the top uh, curve is a very stiff polymer and you see it's almost completely extended without force, active force, but then it actually shrinks in, in size and then finally at very high plane number everything grows again. And the interpretation of this is, is shown, uh, uh, given here. Yeah, so if you have a flexible chain, then the activity actually dominates over the thermal noise and therefore it's locally stretched. Whereas if you have a flexible polymer, then the thermal noise is quote weak compared to the bending rigidity, and therefore the active noise adds additional noise, and therefore it starts to uh, to collapse. And then finally, at high Peclet number, then the active forces dominate everything: curvature forces, active stretching, everything, and therefore all the curves, all the polymers behave the same than for very high Peclet numbers. And then just to give you so that. Right, so here you see that the polymer moving now in the lab frame. Right, so that means, of course, it's not stationary. The po polymer is not someone's just sitting on one uh, uh, position, but it's actually moving in space. And in short times, it has this ballistic motion. And in long times, it has this diffusive motion, which you can guess here. And the diffusive motion is not a, a, um, a passive diffusive motion, but it's actually dominated by the, the activity again. Okay, since I'm uh, kind of running out of time, please allow me to go to the 
to the next uh, topic so that I can tell you at least a little bit about these active membranes and vesicles. So that's just to show you that in a cell, when it's moving and uh, fluctuating and blah, blah, uh, it actually has a very complex um, uh, internal active uh, machinery. And uh, we are just trying to mimic uh, some parts of this from a very physical, simplified, uh, biomimetic uh, perspective. Yeah, so the first model, um, and here actually Seper was uh, strongly involved uh, during his uh, master thesis in developing and analyzing this model. We take again this uh, kind of uh, uh, filaments, but in this case, it's now really self-propelled rods. There is no flexibility uh, and they interact with a membrane. In this case, the membrane is just a hard ring and uh, sorry that I don't forget it. This is again uh, just a two-dimensional model, but I will say something about it in three dimensions in a, in a minute. So, um, so yeah, they are pushing and pulling uh, against this uh, ring, and this is just by by design. Yeah, I mean we can either uh, link the front monomer to the to the membrane, or we can link the the, the rear monomer to the um, to the membrane, and then so in this way we can somehow just control by construction whether they are pulling or pushing uh, filaments. And there is some evidence from, uh, from biological measurements that they are also in cells, they are pulling and pushing uh, filaments in, in a cell. Yeah, and then we can look at different cases. Yeah, and uh, sorry, I, I forgot one point. So these filaments, they have also uh, interaction energy, kind of an excluded volume interaction, but not a complete excluded volume. So only a weak excluded volume. So they can overlap, but they pay uh, a penalty for it. And this is given by this uh, ER, this repulsive energy, which is, is given here. Yeah? So we, we can look at different cases, yeah? either only pushing uh, rods, and, and you can see over here one example, which are very uh, small repulsion, so they can easily penetrate through each other, then a mixed system which has pulling and pushing rods, and uh, finally only pulling rods. And what you notice that the cell motility, well, cell is a hard, big word, the, the motility of this whole object very much depends on what the rods are actually doing. Yeah, so in the first case, where we have this high Peclet number, but they can penetrate rather easily to each other, we see that the overall object just shows this random walk-like motion. If you have pulling and pushing, but then they can, and they form these little clusters because they cannot easily penetrate to each other in this case, then this generates a torque, and therefore this object moves on a circular trajectory for quite a long time. And finally, if you have only pulling uh, rods, then they usually orient perpendicular to the membrane, and then we see this rather long persistent motion. Now, this was for a, a, a fixed shape of the membrane for a ring, for a circle. Now it becomes more interesting if we allow, ex allow actually a flexibility of this object, yeah, so a flexible membrane, because now the membrane can actually react to the pulling and pushing forces. And we see these three main classes, yeah, it's just essentially rather, well, spherical circular objects which are fluctuating, have active fluctuation. We see these keratocyte shapes because they look similar to keratocytes where we have pulling and pushing. And then we have also this kind of shape where we have this uh, long pointed tail and um, many uh, filaments which look a little bit like neutrophils so that we call it neutrophil shapes. And let me show, show this other, this uh, called phase diagram on the next uh, slide in more detail. Yeah, what we see is that there are some different classes of shapes and motility. Yeah, and these are the ones which I actually explained to you, this kind of keratocyte K shapes, and then these two types of neutrophil shapes. And this one down here is actually this uh, fluctuating uh, circular shapes. But you see that all the neutrophil shapes form, have a, a, a fall into this region of this phase diagram. And all, all the keratocyte shapes uh, fall, uh, go over here. Yeah, so they have a a quote a negative aspherosity because they are extended in perpendicular to the propulsion direction. These are elongated in the propulsion direction. Therefore, they have a positive aspherosity. Yeah, and to be fair, and of course, that does not mean that everything has the same velocity. All the keratocyte. 
of course, if you have more propulsion, you have a faster velocity, but this is taken out here in the scaling. So we divide by the number of propelling rods and so on. But still you see that there are these different somehow motility shape glasses, which I found I find very striking. So there is a strong coupling between shape and, and uh, motility. And now we can uh, let this uh, interact with surfaces and, and walls, uh, or sorry, interfaces and walls. Yeah, so in, if I look here, there's, uh, there's a hard wall here. And uh, you can see that as this object comes, this is now this mixed shape pulling and pushing. Yeah, you see it hits the surface, the wall, and then it actually moves along the wall. And so it comes, starts here and then moves in this direction, so parallel to the wall. Whereas if you have here only uh, propelling, uh, only pulling filaments, then you see it, uh, the object hits the wall, but then the filaments reorient inside the, this uh, cell and it's actually reflected, it moves away from the wall. And let me just show this here in this, in this uh, movie. I think this is most impressive. Yes, you see, th this is this uh, first case where you go along the wall. Yeah, you see here again, the motion along the wall. As you see first, this hits the wall, it reorients, it keeps at the wall. So you can't see the motion parallel to the wall, but since these fil filaments here are all uh, pulling, right, the, they all move it up along the wall, as you could see here in this, in this movie. All right, I have something similar for um, motion along an interface between these two regions, but I would like to skip this so that I have a little time to come to my last point. Uh, so this is now really in, in three dimensions. Yeah, let me emphasize again what I've shown you in the last uh, two, three, four slides. This was all some a two-dimensional model system which, which uh, mimics cells, but you can also call it ring polymers. It's of course not, not, not much related to a real cell. This is now a really a fluid vesicle and it has this uh, active particles inside. Let me explain this in a little bit more uh, detail here. And I start the movie because the beginning is a bit slow. So this was actually uh, initiated by uh, our experimental collaborators at the ETH in Zurich, they came to us and said, look, we have this really, and you can see it, yeah, we have this really interesting system. And so here we have this uh, vesicle, uh, you see just the contour because this is a, a cut parallel to the wall. And you have these Janus colloids, which are driven by this hydrogen peroxide reduction. And yeah, you see here some are moving quickly, but then they hit the wall, they're pushing uh, the membrane, they push against the membrane and they form tethers. Tethers are difficult to see, uh, but they are connecting uh, this cluster of active particles to the, to the mother vesicle. You can see here, if you have a high membrane tension, a high passive membrane tension, then uh, the propulsion force is not strong enough. And therefore yeah, you see attempts to form tethers, but it doesn't, just, just doesn't, doesn't work. So we uh, designed a simulation system to look at this, to, to uh, understand this uh, experimental system. And this is just active Brownian spheres in a fluid vesicle. A fluid vesicle just uh, talks about uh, the, the composition of the membrane that it has, is not uh, polymerized, it's not crystalline. So therefore you can have membrane flows, but it again, is not a hydrodynamic model in the sense that it has no momentum conservation. No flow, I mean, there are flows generated by the active forces, but they will stop immediately if you take away the, uh, the forces. Yeah, and we model the membrane by this dynamically triangulated surface. So that means it's a, a, um, a meshwork of, of triangles and it's dynamically triangulated in the sense that uh, if you have such a connection, the red, red connections between this pi and i and j, this connection can be uh, removed and replaced by this uh, connection between L and K. In this way, it remains a triangulated surface, but you avoid this uh, tethering effect that you have a, a mesh like what, what you use to, to go shopping, or at least we, uh, we did it in uh, many years ago. And, uh, but this of course cannot be uh, fluid. Uh, so mesh points which are connected are connected forever. Right? And we, we, we make a pretty big mesh of this. This contains 30,000 uh, triangles, uh, mesh points. Uh, this contains a hundred uh, active particles. The same uh, active particles, which I uh, active um, 
um, brown in spheres, which I explained to you before, and it is a pretty high Peclet number. And now you now you can see here what happens in the simulation. Yeah, so the particles collect at some uh, parts of the membrane. And uh, so the deformation actually helps the membrane deformation, which is generated by some particle helps to collect other particles and they uh, go together, but they can also turn around and go the other way because of this rotational diffusion of the active bounding particles. Yeah, so you see this really very wild uh, tether formation, which can, which can happen and leads to a highly unusual um, non-equilibrium uh, shapes. Yeah, this is actually one advantage of uh, doing this by simulation because uh, in, in the experiment, they could not easily change the Peclet number. It, it's just uh, the Peclet number in the experiments is determined by the um, concentration of the um, hydrogen peroxide. And uh, you cannot go beyond a certain uh, point because then you see the formation of air bubbles, uh, sorry, uh, hydrogen bubbles and um, no, oxygen bubble, I guess. And it doesn't matter. You see uh, formation of gas bubbles and that destroys the whole, the whole system. So they were essentially limited to essentially a single uh, Peclet number. B, but we can explore in the simulation the whole range. And the important point is, yeah, you see um, essentially three different regimes. Yeah, so at low Peclet number, you see this fluctuating regime uh, where you have essentially see spherical shapes, but they are strongly fluctuating, these active fluctuations. You see this tethering regime, we call it also where you see the dritic shapes. And finally, if the concentration of this in, uh, active browning particle is high, then you see this global uh, shape deformations, yeah, prolate shape or bola type uh, vesicle shapes. You have also a little theory for this. And this is, uh, this is this uh, uh, lines, which you see here, the full lines and the dashed lines. I will probably not have time to uh, go into the theory. Let me just give you the, the main uh, aspects. Is so you have again a balance between membrane deformation forces and tension forces. This is yeah. Don't look at the equation. Uh, equation and this competes with the propulsion forces of the active particles. And the, one of the important points is that if you now form clusters, they push stronger against the membrane, so they can uh, form clusters more easily. But on the other hand, you generate also an active tension. Yeah? If the particles are pulling everywhere against, the, uh, pushing everywhere against the membrane, that generates an active membrane tension. And uh, yeah, you think of it as a Laplace pressure. Particles are pushing against the membrane, and that generates a surface tension. And that acts actually against the formation of tethers. Yeah? So therefore, if you increase the particle volume fraction at fixed uh, Peclet number, then you see you you go from tethering to, to no tethering because here the uh, active tension uh, dominates, whereas here the, the pushing forces uh, dominate. Uh, all right, so let me just uh, conclude this part and then I think I'm done. So uh, I have shown you that the cell motility is determined by this interplay between membrane deformity, the um, external forces, which can be friction forces or boundary forces, yeah, boundary to uh, like. Um, hard walls and the internal force reorganization, which you saw both for our 2D and our 3D model and these pushing and pulling forces. Yeah, we uh, have this emergent uh, cell shape velocity and sensing. That means we start with something and then a certain cell shape and velocity uh, emerges and that this can be used for this uh, internal degrees of region can be used for sensing because as you could see, the, the particles can react to the presence of, uh, of surfaces. Yeah, and we think this, this scattering and deflection might actually be an interesting way of also studying uh, selectivity. And then finally, I showed you this sculpting of vesicles by these internal uh, particles with the uh, different uh, types of shapes. So uh, let me thank all the uh, people who have contributed to, uh, to this work. And this was a hiking day in the Eifel, which is a mountainous region uh, close by to Jülich. Uh, this, um, um, a lot of these research was actually funded by a DFG priority program, which was called MicroSwimmers. And I was quite, would like to thank you very much for your attention. And I was probably a little bit over time, I'm sorry. No problem. Actually, that was a beautiful talk. It's amazing how much you can actually capture. 
with this relatively speaking simple models, but, uh, and I invite actually students, postdocs, everybody who's listening to maybe think uh, about uh, taking or adapting similar approaches to your molecular problem, or if you wanna go multi-scale, which would be ideal. So this was, this was really powerful methods and uh, approach in, in terms of doing hierarchical modeling, you can actually integrate in your research. So this was really beautiful. Thank you very much. Uh, you. So I have, maybe I can start, then I can uh, give it to you, Zan. So I had one question. So it seems that in your approach, you are mostly interested in uh, reproducing a particular phenomenon uh, uh, rather than th in, in our approach, kind of at the molecular level. So we have, we are kind of restricted to some experimental numbers, we have to put numbers on the spring constant or distances, et cetera, et cetera. Are there regular numbers in your practice, Dr. Gomper, that you can easily um, get from the experiment or it's mostly phenomenological at this stage? I mean, I, mean, I would say we, we are, yeah, we, I mean, we, we are coming from a, diff, a slightly different uh, some of viewpoint. And I mean, uh, I, I must admit, I'm, I'm, I'm never, never so interested in somehow trying, I have this experimental system and I now take exactly this uh, parameters of the experimental right. system. My, my approach was more to say, oh, this is a really interesting system, phenomenon, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and now let's just see um, if we vary parameters, right? How, how gen generic is this kind of behavior? Do we see, uh, is this special in for this par particular parameter range? And do we see something completely different in another, another parameter range? Yeah, but right. of course, um, I mean, as I say, we, we don't spend a lot of time on this, but of course we're happy to, uh, if we can really make uh, contact uh, with, with real experiments. Sure. And some of the models I was showing you today are certainly too simple. We, there's no way we can uh, mm -hmm. cannot directly compare them uh, with experiments. In the last case, I mean, of this uh, fluid vesicles, right? I mean, there we had the numbers from experiments. And yes, we, of course, we may, we're trying to make uh, mm -hmm. a contact. But I mean, this is, this is um, not e easy, I have to say. I, right. It's the same right. for one, one reason. They cannot change the Piglet number. Yeah? Um, right. we, we can do this. And I think this is a real advantage. Um, but also there are many uh, aspects, of course, in the real experiment, which we have not captured yet. Yeah. Yeah? So we have not included hydrodynamics, for example, but there could also be, but uh, these are the self-propelled particles which generate this um, uh, chemical reaction in the fluid. Mm -hmm. Now, if this comes close to a membrane, yeah, is this changed? Is it still the propulsion force still the same or, or is it different? Is there adhesion force with a membrane? And so, so, I mean, there's a lot of things where you can say, yeah, maybe this is uh, taken right. into account, maybe not. So we are still, I would say, pretty far from really uh, being able to uh, describe a real uh, phenomenon. So I, my, my personal understanding is we are more trying to, to generate scenarios or to say, look, I mean, um, if you do if an you experiment, here would be an interesting yeah. regime or interesting phenomena. Uh, right. Try to, to find it yeah? or try to, to match the parameters. Exactly. No, no, no. This, 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 was, this was very powerful. I repeat what I said. So this, I completely appreciate. Most of the time, actually, at least in our business, uh, there are uh, limitations on the experimental side to give us the right numbers to put in the model. I can imagine this is also the case. Then, Absolutely. Yeah, no, again, that was a very that was a lovely talk. You know, I just you looking at your different shapes, and I think that's what interests the uh, many of us who are listening to you today, is that like with this dendritic motion made you think immediately of a neuron, and there yeah, 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 not exactly. so much actin is more as microtubules, but many people tend to think about their formation, their bundling, their progression, their transport, very similar to what's happening with actin. And some of the others, it looked almost like you had a bacteria that was pinching off something. So, uh, you know, it, it might be that if you, when you work with uh, uh, some experimental groups, uh, one can try to at least characterize what those parameters uh, would be in your model for those different types of filaments that are in biology. Because, uh, it looks like you've worked on actin a lot, but you could also think of looking at the ones for microtubules and uh, would be extremely helpful uh, to sort of get a, a category if it's possible. And then the other thing is, 
Uh, wait, wait, just, let me just say, say one word. I mean, I, I completely agree with you. And, and this really is a, is a motivation for us. Uh, I mean, I think the advantage of this system is that it's so much simpler than, than a real cell, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, microtubules, and of course we were thinking of microtubules and um, actin uh, propulsion and so on, but, but this, this for has branches and, and you need anchoring points and so on. And you immediately have a very complicated uh, system. And of course that would be the goal to go in this direction, absolutely. The, the, the more realistic models have not that much more complexity to them than what you have. It's all, you know, one is always sort of left with is just varying the parameters yourself because maybe those propulsion forces have not been measured well uh, for, for, mm -hmm. for action. And also the same way that those filaments interact, like, well, one thing, uh, often now the, the sort of common wisdom, what changes the propulsion? Well, these things get phosphorylated or dephosphorylated. And it's that that changes their properties, whether they start falling apart, unraveling or what they do. And then the other thing is how they interact with the membrane. There's a little insight into that. Mm -hmm. um, but again, sort of going is like Imad was saying, here we are, we're, we're faced with this reality, this biological system. Um, yeah, we would love to simplify our descriptions at times. Yeah. Um, because even describing how much energy you get from uh, phosphorylation is not always mm -hmm. easy to put into a simulation. So I think there's lots of room to use these more general yeah. models and connect to the biological system. So, um, yeah, we may be writing you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm, happy. I'm happy to. Read. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. My, my uh, mailbox is a bit full, but I mean, a few more mails will fit in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you feel. All right. <laughs> thanks. Well, thanks Taras, a lot for your you coming. had a question? Yes. Um, thank you very much. Very nice and insightful talk. It's inspirational to see how you could capture all these complex envir environments. And I wonder, this is more kind of a, a less question, but a, a kind of a comment. I wonder whether nature, or it's actually a question because I form it as a question. <laughs> I wonder whether nature is actually used a particular part of your phase diagram. In other words, if you look at all the possibilities that Zen just mentioned and Ahmad, whether we will find them kind of, you know, in a narrow band of your uh, phase diagram or in, and like not active, not life matter can have more opportunities. Or really, that there is all what it is. You know. I mean, I think this is both very interesting directions, right? I mean, I, I I'm very much interested in this. Uh, let me call it artificial cell, right? I mean, for for the simple reason that well, I mean, this is more easy for us to model than 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 uh, real cells, and maybe the simulations can actually help to 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 design mm -hmm. uh, some of our cells. But uh, I mean, this this was also a comment also about the previous question, right? I mean, we were actually motivated by this time of microtubules pushing and pulling, right? That was the, uh, right. the motivation for our 2D, 2D model, right? And now in, in two dimensions, unfortunately, you cannot form these, these tethers, yeah? So simply the, some on the, uh, the mechanics uh, for, of the membrane does not allow tether formation in, in 2D. Uh, we don't have to go into detail. It's, it's a, you can convince yourself very easily that this cannot happen, right? So you would actually have to, to go to the 2D model and somehow transfer it into 3D. And then we could have this pulling and pushing filaments, right? And they, but our original idea with the filaments was that they have not only pushing and pulling, but they have also this somehow alignment uh, uh, part. Yeah? So, so if they come together, and that would not happen, of course, for spherical particles, they would align and then have more like uh, what you think of an actin bundle or, or a, a microtubule uh, construction. Yeah? Um, we simply have not been able to, to do this yet, but it's, it's certainly an interesting uh, direction to go. Very Thanks cool. a lot. Very cool. Thank you. Okay, any other questions from the audience? I don't see anything in the chat or anything else here. Zan, your hand's still raised, I, but I guess you're done. <laughs> I can't put it down. The button doesn't work. Okay, Once okay enough, but I'm okay. just checking. That I'm doing my job. <laughs> okay, so well, I thank you again, uh, Dr. Gomper. This was really inspirational talk, and I think we all got inspired, and hopefully everybody gets new ideas how what else they can do, how they can extend their simulations and models. To, to be able to capture better phenomena. We have a 
they have a huge interest in membrane, many of us. And then the, I was really interested in your membrane model and how we might use that for, for example, for fusion and describing this, this kind of phenomena. That would be wonderful. Thanks again. Uh, I know that now we are a little bit over time, but that's perfectly fine. So you are meeting with Seper. Seper is yes, going to show you some yeah, yeah, yeah. mechanical effects in his molecular simulation of membrane. Uh, and uh, so I thank you. And as Zan said, we might write you shortly. <laughs> I, I, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> All right. Thanks okay. again for the thank invitation you. and for the nice discussions. Yes. Yeah, bye, bye bye. Thank you. Cheers. Bye bye. Cheers. So, Seper, you, uh, we I'm, are, I, you I'm